1973 East Broadway, this is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. Such a high honor to bring in somebody who I've actually never connected with uh, in person, but like most of my guests, um, her aura exudes one of positivity and light, and uh, it only gets stronger when she gets out of her own way and tries to uh, manage her ego as we are all trying to do in this very uncertain time when you can feel the tectonic plates shifting amongst us as we walk on the ground. Grandmother Earth is crying out for help and uh, there's also a tremendous imbalance uh, well, in, in equity and I think also in unity and heart. Uh, my guest is somebody who I think is always trying to bridge that gap and uh, one of the reasons I do my show is to be able to um, court people like her to come on the program in order to shed light, enlightenment, and inspiration for those who may be looking towards the dark or giving up hope because it kind of feels that way right now. Marnie Sklaroff, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, can I just talk to you about, like, um, the uh, how you f this week particularly how you feel the vibration and the energy that's out in the universe right now um, sure so what I'm feeling is this you know move towards autumn um, we just step through the threshold of the midpoint between summer solstice and the fall equinox and I can definitely feel a sense of momentum starting to build and um, you know summer for me is always a time of kind of recharging and resting and, and now I, I always feel a little bit more energy to um, like a more extroverted kind of energy in the fall and then of course in the winter it's a time to kind of rest again but um, I feel there's a lot of momentum for people to you know, just get more clear about what they want to bring into the world. Um, and it's a creative energy, it's a faster moving energy, um, and it feels, it feels energizing and fun for me right now. Um, this, it's, it happens every, every summer this way, or is this something, I mean, we are living through unprecedented times you still feel the same rules apply to a absolutely well, I, abnormal so, well, times I, you know here's the thing um so okay so you're talking about like the bigger picture like you know the pandemic and all that stuff um you know nature is always happening like we're always part of that and there are definitely many different spirals that are happening all the time and so there's the sort of like cultural global situation of the pandemic and COVID and, you know, all the other things that are also happening, all the, you know, shifting, changing scenarios culturally and um, environmentally and humanitarian wise. But then there's also nature being nature and she has her own rhythms, her own flows. And so I guess that's what I was kind of tuning into when you asked me that question. But um, in terms of like what's happening presently globally with the pandemic um, no I wasn't talking I mean I mean you okay. recognize that the uh, the Amazon is on fire the lungs of the planet are on fire so grandmother earth is is hurting you 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 feel that oh my gosh always all right so I mean like the idea is that you're talking about I mean I'm not trying to be a wet blanket. I, I guess maybe I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate. You're talking about momentum. I mean, I, I, I just being a spirit being, being somebody in the intergalactic. I mean, I I feel the weight and the gravity of the despair out there. I mean, are you? Do you feel the? I mean, are you tapped into that, or or are you still? Um, when you say momentum, are you really just talking about your own path? Um, I guess, I mean, I'm speaking personally, um, because that's really what I can speak to. I think, um, you know, we all have our own rhythms. And for me, right now, I mean, there's the despair. Of course, there's the despair. It's all there. Um, and I'm also still living my life and participating
like madness and um, a lot of people are hurting the earth is hurting and um, also I believe in I believe in beauty and I believe in um, continuing to celebrate being alive I think that we have to continue to do that and I, I think dig. That's what nature, no, I dig. Nature. I dig. Yeah. So, um, you know, how have you how have you adapted? I mean, are you a a, a, so, a, a social uh, creature by habit? I, I it hasn't really stunted my. I mean, I, the last couple of years I spent a lot of time on the road as a rogue journalist, uh, doing a kind of a, a Kerouacian type mission, and um, so I I mean I have not been traveling and I. Don't plan on it because I don't think it's safe. Um, but has there been like, based on your profession, your lifestyle, have you been have you been able to adapt to that? I mean, a lot of people um, in different modal healing modalities, uh, they will uh, travel a lot, commune a lot with other people, travel around the world, and it's cool. But it's not really happening, and I just. I think adaptability is, is the key to not just surviving, but thriving in this time. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about an example of, you, of your adaptability during this uh, extended pause. Mm. Um, well, I guess for me, it's, there, you know, it's been hard in certain ways, but also really nice because um, I, I wasn't one of those traveling yogis. Um, so, I mean, you're, I love to you're, travel. You're, you're more like a, a, stat, a stay-at-home yogi? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an introvert, I guess you could say. Yeah, I dig. Um, yeah. Um, I'm very, you know, I, I have friends and I'm very outgoing when I'm with people, but then I like a lot of alone time. So, um, you know, I was for a while wanting to go live in a cave somewhere. <laughs> um, so I was actually, before this whole thing happened, trying to move more of my business online so I could stay home more often because I have little kids, um, two eight-year-old twins, and I like being home with them. And um, I am enjoying the extra time that we're having together. Um, and it's a challenge to like balance the work and mothering because I'm also a single parent. And so that's definitely been a challenge, but it's also... Um, I feel like it's opening up new possibilities for the way that we do things in the world, and I feel like it's causing me to recognize how much I appreciate local community and um, having a having a sacred home base that you take really good care of. And I've been doing so many walks and hiking, and I've been spending a lot of time on the Appalachian Trail, and that's been wow amazing That's um beautiful and so i've just been like and you don't have to like you don't have to like i mean my daughters um one of them just started school in two i mean in arizona we start incredibly early but i mean there it's like 7 30 in the morning i'm up cooking bacon and eggs and you know i'm playing monopoly with with my eight-year-old and you know she's at the studio with me right now um and so I mean, are you, do you feel like people, uh, not you per se, but do you feel like there are other people that um, one of the reasons this has been um, traumatic for people is not so much that they've lost loved ones or they know people that have died. It's just um, their quality of life has been changed and a lot of the focus was on commodification materialism, desire, uh, toys, houses, Legos, and now it's really more simple. It's more about nature and sitting in the silence and trying to spend quality time with your kids and exercising and and do you think people are do you think people are struggling with that adjustment? Oh, definitely. I mean, I you know, I talk to a lot of people and I know you know, especially like there's single people who are struggling because they don't, you know, they're just alone now all the time. Um, and that's really difficult and very unhuman, right? It's not, you know, it's, we're, yeah, we're... It definitely we're is not just, human. It's not, it's no. not the way we as sentient beings operate. Yeah, no, we're, we're social creatures and 
Um, so that's really hard. I mean, there's all the, like, you know, people are struggling financially. I mean, there's all the different layers of it. But I think um, I think it's, it's causing people to reassess, like, what matters to them. And that's a difficult process. But I also think it's super necessary. And this... needed to change the way we've been living on this planet for a very long time and so you know hopefully this is you know going to give us all an opportunity to kind of look at ways that we can live more sustainably more in balance more at the rhythm of nature um because things move really fast in the in the culture that we've been living in and I think as human beings, we're not we're not fast moving like that. Um, you know, we're 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 not we're, we're animals basically, and um, we are we're human it, animals. That's the way we. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, you're 100 percent right, Marty. You know, I I mean, I appreciate you, um, you know, coming on my program today. I think I've done uh, in the last 10 years. I've sort of been on this totally insecure path. Uh, cultivating a, a brand you know walking away from a stable teaching gig and going back to my true nature on the radio and I just we have a game on this program called name that voice I don't expect you to know who it is but if I could really boil my whole show and uh, everything that's come with it and will continue to come uh, this poetic riff would be it and so take a listen to it and we'll come back okay. I think that no matter what happens worldwide with business or whatever have you know however you want to uh, you know say it or call it what we are as people what we are as humans never really changes I mean we all have a heart it we all come from the spirit you know I think what happens is over a period of time or through culture and the uh, cultural erosion and whatever you want to call it, uh, our spirits and our souls get covered with a lot of complexity and a lot of garbage. You know, that we are, what we are as people, what we are as humans, what we are as beings gets covered with a lot of, with a lot of trash. But what we are in essence is always there because it has to be there because that's what we are so you know when something comes along like something beautiful or something energetic or something that's inspiring it rekindles that natural essence that's in all of us and that's why you see different things happen at different times you know because people are made of love. People are made of hope. And if there's an opportunity for something that shows up that illustrates that, then it plugs that energy in to people again. You know, so even though things look dark or even though things look uh, manipulated and whatever you want to call it right now, there's a lot of terminology, mm -hmm. you know, what we are is infinite. What we are is always there. Marnie, that, that interview was with a, um, a really amazing musician named Ernie Watts. He, he did most of his career, he's still playing, I guess, but spent most of his time in the studios in L.A. playing multiple reed instruments. He has Native American blood and really serious spiritual cat. And... Um, you know, he talked about natural essence, and, you know, I gravitate towards people who are not people that are trying to uh, redesign themselves. Uh, they're um, sort of, they've been sitting in the mess for a long time, um, and sort of like a lotus flower uh, blooming amidst the swamp, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, in the past, uh, how you've learned to, you know, what he was talking about, plugging back into the source and rekindling 
the natural essence inside all of us. I think it, and I think, you know, for some people, they just go, you know, you'll hear people that just bowl right through it. Just, there's nothing to see here. Just keep going. And they, and they just bury it and it winds up working its way out with neuroses. And I, I'd like you to talk about the path that you've been on. And, uh, when you, um, when you finally learn to get out of your own way and, and access your true nature. Mm, um, I mean, I feel like, okay, so I'm definitely still on the path and I still do get in my own way sometimes. <laughs> and um, Obviously, but, I mean, it's a learning yeah. experience, but I mean, like where, totally. because, you know, my, I mean, for me, I, I fought it for so long and it ma manifested with a lot of uh, anxiety and, and ruminating thoughts. This is in my 20s, but um, anyway, I don't want to make it out that I'm just asking you to, to talk yeah. about being yeah, vulnerable yeah, yeah. because I mean yeah. everyone's dealing with it so yeah, yeah, yeah. no I get it um, um, I think for me it was definitely yoga that sort of opened the door into me kind of settling into myself um, when I took my first yoga class 25 years ago I could feel for the first time a sense of being in my body um, and I think before that, I kind of always felt like I was sort of floating above my body. And um, and I'd been a dancer my whole life, too. And it wasn't really until I took a yoga class that I really felt like I started to land again into my being. And um, I think the breath, learning how to breathe and learning how to move and learning how to listen to the sensations in my body and learning how to trust um, my own body's limb. The way that it was strong and the way that it could get stronger and the way that it could be opened. And um, I think that was huge for me. Um, and that also has helped me so much in just managing emotions. And um, my meditation practice has taught me how to see my mind and how to recognize thoughts that are mostly not true um, and to to not always believe what I'm thinking um, and that's been huge for me and I think so much of our belief like it, it's often our belief systems that keep us out of the truth and much of my work especially in the past five years I would say has been kind of dismantling my own beliefs mm -hmm. and I saw, actually, I saw a post you put up on uh, Instagram today about um, kind of the church of you. That's the most effective place of worship or something to that effect. Yeah, it's like the breath. It's your breath. Yeah. And, and yeah. so, I mean, can you talk about, because I, I mean, this is not unique. I, I was fortunate to be raised in a somewhat agnostic house. I guess we were you know, happy, open, t somewhat tolerant people, I guess, but not monotheistic or I didn't grow up with a lot of rigid thought patterns. Can you say that, that you were, that there was a lot of dogma that you had to, to let go of? Um, I wouldn't say religious dogma because um, we were kind of like Jewish, but sort of like culturally Jewish in my Oh, I didn't, it did. I, I'm so, I can't believe how naive I am. I, yeah, no, we were so, we were so like, bagels and locks in the city with my, my yeah. grandparents, right? Culturally Jewish, yeah. but I mean, I didn't even get bar mitzvah, except my name is so Jewish, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I did get bar mitzvah, actually, but then, you know, it didn't really have a lot of meaning for me. Um, I, you know, it was sort of, it, di it didn't, it wasn't my spirituality at all. It was a cultural thing, it felt like. Um, but I think for me, the dogma that I've had to really face is cultural dogma, um, you know, with like, eating disorders and, um, you know, learning the, the way that, you know, kids are being taught in schools that I was being taught in school is very difficult for me. I had a really hard time sitting at a desk all day and listening to someone talk about something that I didn't really understand. Absolutely. Like I didn't know it. it. So um, I feel like the cultural dogma was my most, that's kind of what I, what I deal with and what my struggle is always about. My relationship to spirit feels very clear and clean, and I don't, I don't, you know, I, you know, it's been a process. You know, I went through a whole, you know, like I was in a 
Buddhist um, community for a while and got really caught up in this whole Tibetan Buddhist community and then was in different yoga communities for a while um, and definitely got caught up in some rigid thinking for a few years in my yoga career but um, I've moved through that and now I feel like I'm in a super clean place with my relationship to spirit and to soul and I feel like I just have a direct communication there and I don't I don't question it it's not anything I have to believe in because it's just my relationship with it um, but the cultural stuff I feel like that's the most difficult for me definitely you mean, like, like I mean you mentioned like I mean never being satisfied with your body and that's why you had eating disorders like can you can you talk about specifically what um, what, what was I mean like sitting at a desk and listening to biology lecture that's not you know that's you're just you're you're an active person who needs to to do kind of like you know uh, bhakti movement in order to learn effectively but as far as culturally I mean just the, the shame I mean did you feel shame or, or judgment um I think it was more like a feeling of um, feeling out of control and I think it has to do like my eating disorders were I there was definitely the piece of like you know we're being shown these images of women in the media all the time and then you're comparing yourself to that um, and you know when you're a teenage girl that's like you're trying to figure out how you fit in mm. and so you see what the media is showing you and you sit you think oh well if I in order to fit in I'm supposed to look like that um, and it's a very limited vision for women, especially young girls in, in our culture, you know, there's like one body type, but that's slowly starting to change, which is really good. But I think for me, it was more about feeling out of control. Um, what does that mean? What does that, were you, can you just talk a little bit about, I mean, cause out of control um, means, um, well, it means any, you know, it can mean a lot of different types of things. So, I mean, was it to the point where like you were, you know, like uh, really hurting yourself to the extreme of like not eating to try to match something that society says, or were you, you know, like getting in a lot of trouble or, you know, what was the, why were you yeah, out of control? I wasn't getting into trouble. It was more that um, I think I felt like I, so I think the way that I experienced school when I was growing up was that it the school setting is so much about conformity and you know our schools are basically designed to teach people how teach kids how to be obedient and how to memorize and there's not a lot of room for creativity yeah, that's and, true. For quest and for questioning and for having original ideas And so for me, I was a super sensitive, empathic kid, and also very um, creative, and I had a lot of physical energy, and it was really difficult for me to like conform to the way that school was being taught at that time. And it's still kind of going that way these days in public schools. Um, and so I felt, I, I felt like I, I didn't know how to be successful in that environment and it felt it you know of course as a, ch a child you want to fit in and you want to feel like you are a part of something and I didn't feel like I fit in and I didn't feel like I was a part of something and I didn't understand how to fit in and so I think that was the sense of feeling like not in control and feeling very ungrounded and feeling like I didn't belong and so part of my eating disorder came from that, a sense of feeling like, okay, this is something I can control. This is something I have control over. This is something I can do mm. to make myself feel safe. Um, so I think it came from, you know, there's so many other factors as well, obviously, but that I feel like was the big picture kind of piece of it. You know, um, do you... Um... Do you believe that there's a crisis within the the community, the yoga community, um, as it relates to 
uh, people getting taken advantage of by teachers who have elevated to a certain level where they're, you know, sort of indoct they're um, enshrined in this, this, you know, almost guru um, uh, status, and then all of a sudden it's like, um, you know, it's not just men, it's women sometimes too, but they wind up getting involved with their students or, you know, not even, you know, much worse than that. And, and I just, the more I talk to people, you vaguely mentioned being part of different communities and the sort of rigid thought patterns that mm -hmm. went on in those communities. And I, I think it's important for someone like you who, you know, has just been on their path for a long time and is, you know, in, in a good way, like sort of reclusive, um, if, if you can talk a little bit of, to, to people listening or that will hear this, who might be in one of these sort of, I don't know what the right word is, codependent or, you know, somewhat toxic communities, how to identify it through your experience and how, the, how do you have the strength to get out of it? Um, so are you asking me, like, how do people get out of, like, those unhealthy... I'm saying, I'm, what, I'm saying what I'm saying is there are people right now all over the world that, that are in these types, situations that you probably were in in your, in your, in your past. And I'm trying to get, I'd like you to talk about your story and how you eventually said, I need to think for myself... I can't yeah. be taken advantage. I don't know if you were being taken advantage of or whatever it is. I mean, how did you have the, because at that point it's drop. I mean, that's when you have to drop from your head to your heart into what I call the primordial gut or the soul in order to access your multidimensional being so that you have the ability to transcend or ascend and get out of this, uh, rid this, you know, this environment of, of uh, you know, very, um, it's, I don't want to say group think, but, you know, it's, it, it can be hard to get out of those, those types of situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a process. I'm, you know, luckily for me, I, I was never really hurt personally um, in the community that I was, you know, through the different community. Well, I had one yoga teacher that physically, hurt me, at, you know, with like an adjustment, you know, but that, ha that happens a lot. And that was, that was difficult. And so, you know, it took me some time to realize like that that wasn't the kind of teacher that I wanted to study with. Um, and I definitely learned from that experience that that was also the kind of teacher that I did not want to be. Like I knew that I didn't want to use that kind of force. You know, that was, I think, part of the sort of lineage that that teacher was from is that you know, that was like part of it. And they would just kind of hurt the students to teach them something. And I knew that that wasn't the kind of teacher I wanted to be. Because um, I experienced the effects of that. And it wasn't, it felt like trauma. It didn't feel like, it didn't feel like light. It didn't feel like freedom. It felt like it was more binding. And I think, I think that's, you know, there's, the Buddha said something that I think, and you know, who knows if the Buddha really said it, but said that the Buddha said that enlightenment always tastes like freedom. And I think that, you know, that is, I, I think, a really useful mantra to hold on to for ourselves to and, and to ask ourselves questions like, and to use our own senses. Um, Absolutely. Anything that brings us... Can you say what you just said? It. What was that line again? The Buddha like said... Enlightenment tastes like freedom. It <laughs> always tastes like freedom. And, and you know, I think it's important that he uses the, the senses, like the taste. Like, it's not like enlightenment thinks like freedom. It's like it is. It, ta it, it is freedom, and so we would be able to feel it in our own being, in our own body. Um, and I think what often happens is we we take ourselves out. We, we, it's like we come to yoga because we got, we've forgotten how to trust ourselves or we come to a spiritual practice because we want to learn how to trust ourselves. Mm. That's really, that's really why we all. And so we come to a, a, a practice because we want to learn how to trust ourselves again. Um, and then 
you know, for a little bit of time, we kind of have to learn how to trust another person. Sometimes we have to learn how to trust another person so that we can learn how to trust ourselves. And it's, I think that's kind of how the guru, the like unhealthy, toxic guru student relationship can happen is that the student thinks that they're learning how to trust the teacher, but really what they're trying to learn is how to trust themselves. And what the teacher is also doing is they want the student to trust them rather than trust themselves. And so that I feel like is the dynamic that's unhealthy. And then I had to, you know, go through a bunch of different communities where I just had to really devote myself to a teacher and like believe everything that they said and think it was the truth. And that was part of my journey. And I think it was important. And then slowly over time, I started to feel in my own body. I was like, I would say something when I was teaching yoga. I was like that. I don't really know that. It's not really true. Hmm. It'd be words that I heard another teacher say, and I right. would say it. Right. Cause, but I was like, wait, that doesn't actually make sense in my life or in my body or in my experience. And so, Can you give an example? I, um, I had teachers. This is just the first one that came to my head. I had a teacher that was a very, very, um, very super into veganism, being a vegan. And that was like their whole thing. And it was like, they believed that everybody should be vegan. And that was the way that we were going to save the world. And if you were not vegan, you weren't a good yogi. And, <laughs> um, and so I did that for a while. And I also started to get really angry. And I started to like get angry at other people for eating meat. And I realized I was starting to, it was making me feel actually more separate from the world and not closer to it. And I felt more disconnected from people. And um, I was, I had kind of had this ego trip about my own veganism and that it might made me kind of better than people who weren't vegans. And, um, and I think there are lots of great reasons to eat vegan, but I don't think it's the only way. And I don't think that it's good for everyone. And I also believe that it doesn't make someone a better person if they eat vegan. Um, but at that time, that was kind of what was, what I was being indoctrinated into. Um, and I get it like for them, that's their truth, but it wasn't my truth, but it took me some time to realize that and, and to realize that I think people should eat what they want to eat and, you know, eat what makes them feel good. And it's not my job to police other people's like dietary habits. And I don't want that to be my job. <laughs> you felt that when you like for the, for the time that you were trying to acquiesce to their, their truth that you became... Yeah judgmental towards other people if they were not vegan totally yeah, yeah. And, and then i realized i was like that's not yoga like this is making me feel yeah. more disconnected not i'm not feeling more connected to people i'm feeling less connected to people and i for me that's always a clue that i'm missing the mark who 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 did you who were you able to to i agree with you about the for a lot of the healers that i talk to that yoga is about learning to restore trust or for the first time have trust in, in, in yourself. Um, did you have people that you could trust growing up or, or did you find yourself oftentimes uh, being un untrusting of the world based on your experience and, and therefore um, maybe um, resentful or um, just not happy. I think what my situation was, if I kind of reflect on it, was that I trusted other people more than I trusted myself, and so that got me into a lot of trouble. But not, but not yoga instructors, just other people. Yeah, I think in general, like as a time, like thinking about like when I was a kid. Yeah, and that that's kind of. I mean, don't we do that though? I mean, your parent, yeah. right, your parents, yeah. or something. You do. That's kind of normal. It's not yeah, sort of. Yeah. You know. But then, like as a teenager, and then also when I came to yoga, I think that was also my experience at the beginning and then I kind of trusted the teachers more than I trusted myself which I think for me like that was just my path and I needed to do that um I you know luckily like you know I've had definitely hard experiences in my life but um you know I'm one I'm, in, I'm a whole person <laughs> so um you know I'm my soul is is together so I feel you know 
like I've been through a lot of challenges. I've had a bunch of, you know, a few really traumatic experiences that have taken me a long time to process and work through. But, um, you know, it's just part of the, part of me learning to be me. Um, I don't know. Did that answer your question? Well, I, I mean, I'd like you to, t to talk a little bit about, you know, if you can share about, um, I, I don't think people understand that part of my show is about life overcoming adversity and um, I don't think people realize that I mean God forbid you you never get out of it but you know if you if you can overcome the adversity then you know it you're just constitutionally you become stronger you know I mean you just you, it, it just at, at, a, at a spiritual level at a psychic level and yeah. just sort of your natural senses and I and I we don't really deal with platitudes, so I mean, can you talk about the uh, traumatic experience and how you overcame it and how it made you stronger? Um, sure. Um, when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with depression, and I was, you know, cutting myself and tried to kill myself a few times, and was put in a hospital um, for a month, and then again for ten days uh, for depression. And um, I think that was. You know, you can imagine, um, I, you know, it, it, it was an experience, it was kind of an initial, um, I kind of lost myself, and in the hospital, healing definitely did not happen, it was, you know, not a healthy experience for me, um, and it was difficult, it was scary, it was, um, you know, not fun at all, um, and, and then when I left, there was probably about, f it took me, you know, a good, like, three years, uh, probably longer, I would say, to feel like a normal human being, like, I, from that experience, I had, I definitely was identifying myself as someone who was definitely screwed up and had something wrong with me. Um, and then I came, to, I found yoga, and it was after college, and for the first time in my life, people were talking in a way that made sense to me. Like, the yoga teacher was saying things that I felt like I'd already known, and that no one had ever said to me before in that way, but it all made sense. For the first time, they were speaking in a language that I could completely understand, that made sense to me. And that was my, like, slow journey back to myself and to seeing myself as a whole, complete human being and not somebody who is inherently broken. Um, and I will always have a tendency towards the kind of, you know, that sort of melancholy, I think, um, which I think is part of my gift because it forces me to go slower sometimes. Mm. And, to, it's like a truth serum. I think depression is a truth serum. I think depression comes when we're, we're out of alignment with, with our wisdom. And, um, and I'm not saying that I would wish it on anybody, but for me, that's part of my rhythm. And, you know, I have to take really good care of myself, and I do. I take exquisite care of my body and my spirit and my soul and my mind and my heart because I need to um, because depression is not a joke and um, I want to keep myself in the light and um, but I think that you know that I, I was 16 years old when I was put in a hospital for a month and that was definitely a very difficult experience and you know I, why, I was why, let me away. ask you a question why why what was because I agree I know what you're saying like when you when you found yoga and the and the teacher started to say things that it was like a musical language you know it spoke to you you understood it it was it made sense but what was spoken to you, what was what was given to you what did, I mean I guess the Dalai Lama Dalai Lama said you know uh, most people think my religion is Buddhism and he said wrong my my religion is happiness 
and I can hear in you um, that it, it's a constant process for you to clean out these dark corners of your heart. Some people would call mm -hmm. that is depression. Um, and I have the, I deal with it too, um, and it was, um, but I didn't. It wasn't stigmatized by my family. I, I, and I just wonder. I mean, did you not receive love as a as a young girl? Um, I think I I received love. You know, Why did you? Way. I guess what I'm saying is, what 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 didn't make sense though that the language of yoga finally spoke to you. But were people just saying, Marnie, just get over yourself, like, or they never cared to know. They never even saw the pain you were in, or the fact that they were that you were hurting yourself. I mean, you clearly felt that you were. I don't want to say worthless, but you didn't have a lot of self worth if you wanted to kill yourself. Yeah, I think they just didn't understand. They didn't understand why I was, why I felt the way I felt, because you know we had everything we needed. We lived in an upper middle class suburban neighborhood in New Jersey, and there wasn't like anything wrong on the outside. But I was, I was, what I was responding to, I think, was the dynamics of the culture that we live in. It's like the underneath, like all the stuff that's being brought up to the surface right now in the, with the pandemic and Black Lives Matter and, you know, all the stuff. It's like all coming up. And the whole like financial, like just the system. Absolutely. No, I mean, all, all the, it's all, yeah, it's everything's being exposed for how, and so like, yeah. I could see all of that when I was a kid. Can you get, I mean, because I mean, I think we're, what are we, like on Route 4 in Paramus? Where, where did you live? Um, in Cherry Hill, right outside of Philly. No, you didn't. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God! Well, I, I'm really sorry. I, I was. I, I mean, I, I'm. This is so. Because I was. I, are you a Gen Xer? Yeah, I'm a Gen Xer. Oh my! Did so. you go to Cherry Hill East? I did. Oh my! My <laughs> best friends. I'm not even kidding with you. My. Well, the. I don't know. Did you know? I don't oh, know. <laughs> I can't ask the question. <laughs> um, I cannot believe. Dude, Cherry yeah. Hill, yeah. my dearest yeah. friends are the Krevlins and the Cressmans. Oh, so funny. And the Getzes yeah. and B and Brian Getz. Is that your our generation or are you older? I feel like I, I feel like I've heard Brian Getz, but I feel like I've heard Brian him. Getz definitely. I cannot believe you were from Cherry Thrill. That is un. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm a Long Island cat, and so I mean, funny. I have friends in Long Island still, but my best friends are from Jersey and a bunch of them, you know, used to go to uh, Vito's Italian yeah. restaurant all the time. And uh, I don't know, do psychedelics and go into Philly and see jazz. I mean, the whole thing was so crazy. I cannot, that's a, th see, but that's a really, you know, we grew up in similar environments yeah. and there you're right. I mean, culturally, if you are, especially if you have parents who are very, hard driving people then then you are confronted with these societal things that clearly you looked at and said this is not who i am yeah yeah that was that was what was that was the inc the incongruency i think for me it's like i you know there was like my parents weren't hard driving at all they were super laid back and in certain ways i mean there was certain certain things that my mom you know she was really really into me like looking a certain way and doing my hair a certain way and wearing the right clothes and all that kind of stuff, which I totally rebelled against. Um, <laughs> but you, um, she wanted you to wear, what, and you were like wearing like hippie dresses or something? Yeah, yeah. I did. And, um, you know, she was not into that at all. I, I cannot believe you went to church. So, I mean, yeah. did you ever, can you talk to people because someone like yourself has developed a container of resources and self self love and a lot of clarity and sovereignty but like you said there's a lot of people and you you know I interview a lot of healers musicians and I can't imagine how useless and horrible um, you know road dog musicians feel because they don't they're not working like they have no work 
And, you know, can you talk about when you, like, look to the dark side and said it's over it was there a point where we were like i'm out and then you know all of a sudden this this one little piece of there's a there was a light that shined somewhere and you kept your eye on the light and to this day that has always been a reminder of the fact that the universe uh that you, you that you were meant to be here because i think as we move forward in this especially as long as the current administration's in power that it's just going to get worse and it's not there's no incentive for these people to make it better um and i and i wanted you to just talk to people about you know who are in total darkness when you were in that place how did how did that light come through because to me that's sort of when that light comes in that is when you rec at least i recognized and I never got to the depths of the like hospitalization and stuff, but you recognize that you are a conduit for you're 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 a conduit for enlightenment from the heavens. And I I mean not that that you knew that at the time, but was there a time that you know this little light went on and you saw it and it, and and it saved your life? Um, I can't think of a specific. Like, I don't have a specific memory of that. I mean, I think what always kind of would keep me going sometimes is like, you know, that that there's a mystery and we don't really know what's going to happen next. And there's possibilities that we can't even imagine. And, um, you know, I think what depression for me has, what I think the beautiful thing about it is that it kind of brings you face to face with the mystery. And I think that, you know, that kind of impulse, it's like the mind sort of turns it into this, like, oh, I need to kill myself kind of story. But I think what's beneath that, if you go underneath that story that your mind is saying, which is an untrue story, because your soul would never want you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you go beneath that, it's saying like, whatever's been going on needs to stop because it's time for something new. So it's like a, it's like the ego is dying, really, is what's happening. Like part of the ego, part of your like identity that's not working anymore for you, that's too small for who you are becoming. Like that's what I think it is, and that's my experience of it. Now is that it's like a, my ego is dying, a part of my ego, part of my the way that I identified myself to make myself smaller. It's done, and it's. I'm growing and I'm getting bigger and I'm becoming more full of light and in order to become more full of light I need to let this part of me die um, and that is so you know it's like what I like to do now is I um, I create rituals when I get into depression sometimes and especially during this time you know the pandemic yeah. it's it's been coming yeah, forward talk a about lot. that that's cool talk about that yeah, and I, and I think for a lot of people, depression is coming forward a lot. And so what I like to do is I ritualize it. Because it's like, if you think of like a funeral, because it is a part of you that's dying, and it is a, you're, you're going through a grief, a grief process. And, you know, we're all grieving the way things were, like every single one of us. We've all lost something. If it, you know, maybe it was a friend who died, or someone got sick, Absolutely. or we lost a job, or we just lost like that sense of normalcy and that sense of rhythm. And and so depression is going to come forward, I think, pretty much for everyone in some way. And so, just like a funeral, you, it's like you want to create a ritual. And so I ritualize my depression now, and I. I use essential oils, um, I light candles, I take a bath in salt, I do things to like really take care of myself. I go out in nature and I sit with a tree and just like lay on the ground and just surrender and, and just let nature do what nature wants. dreams is really good I, I write I have a dream journal and I write my dreams down there's a lot of information that comes through um, for me during times of depression um, my dreams have been crazy lately um, and what kind so of dream what kind of dreams oh I mean all different kinds of dreams um, 
you know, like I just write them all down, um, so I don't have to remember them. <laughs> and then I can go back. Dude, that's a book. That's a book right there. Yeah, and then I go back and um, I look at the symbols, and I, you know, can ask. I ask myself questions, and um, in my life coaching work, I help people analyze their dreams, and that's such a fun process. It's like a, it's like a guided meditation. It's so beautiful, and. Um, and you learn about your soul through your dreams and through ritual and depression to me is like it's taking you down into your soul your soul is that descending current the soul is like nature right mm. and you get to the soul it's like the earth it's the dark it's the soil it's the depths and depression takes you right there it's like the direct it's like the direct elevator button to the soul. That's what I think. And so instead of being afraid of the depression, if we can like ritualize it and, and realize that it's there to help us heal and to help us move through whatever needs to move through and to release whatever needs to go, I think that's um, then you get the medicine from it. You know, um, do you feel like I guess I'm just asking as if I showed up at your door one day and said, why do you, why should I, why do you have street, why do you have street cred as a life coach? I mean, you've been very open in this interview about still processing your own uh, habitual nature and things like that. So, and that, and, and obviously all teachers are, still learning in, the, in that process, but what's your superpower, Marnie? Mm, um, well, I know how to listen. I'm, I'm a really good listener. Um, and I, you know, as a life coach, it's not my job to give people any answers, thank goodness. Um, the answers are inside of them, and what I'm really good at doing is helping people learn how to access their own inner GPS um, and access their own wisdom, their own soul and um, you know I know how to make very complicated abstract concepts very simple for people and I know how to help people get grounded back into their bodies um, and I believe that all the answers are in the body and so um, that's you know that's I think that's what I do and that's what I'm good at. Well, what's an example of something complex that you can break down into a, you know these abstractions? I mean, it's that's a that's definitely a genius quality. So, what do you mean? Um, well, I think like what I just explained to you about depression. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't think of it that way. You know, a lot of people think of it as a pathology, as something wrong. Yeah, but you're not, I mean, you're, I mean, with all due respect, you're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So, I mean, like, you're Definitely a life coach, you know, so yeah. it's like, I mean, to ritualize it, that's somebody who speaks from experience of dealing with this for decades. So, I don't, like, I'm, 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 I'm more talking about, like, accessing their inner GPS. For some people, that's completely dor dormant. The synapses have never even been shut, turned on. So, I mean, how, how do you even, I guess that's the point I'm looking at is like, how do you energize, how do you engage or, 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 you know, turn on that natural essence with people if they come find you uh, in order for them to tap into their GPS? Because, I mean, people like us have been working on it for years, but for some people, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. Well, so I think the first thing is I just get them to learn how to pay attention to their breath and I teach them how to breathe and once they start breathing they're in their feeling sensation in their body and then I teach them how to feel sensation in their body which for some people that's a big leap because they're not used to feeling their bodies um, and then um, the other thing which is so simple that it, you know, people think it's so complex, but it's really so simple. Is I just teach people to listen to their curiosity, um, the hmm. things that the things that excite them, the things that bring them joy, the things that they're curious about. Those are like little clues. Those are like they're like little markers on the map. Um, 
and so you know people talk about intuition all the time but like people don't really understand what it is and you know there are all these different ways that intuition shows up and one of them is just like what are you what are you curious about what do you want to learn more about that's your intuition um, and so you know sometimes people come to me and they're like I don't even know what I like I don't even know what brings me joy and so we kind of start there you know it's like what are the things oh is it like you know is it basil is it the smell of grass mm -hmm. like what do you like like what you know the feeling of silk on your skin you know so we just go back into like their senses um do you, you know, have do you have to like like if you for some people it's so it, like it, for you to say sometimes it's like i go out and just sit under a tree like you said and just you know s soak in the nature and the and and grandmother earth no matter what's going on in my head but for some people like you have to actually go out into nature with some people who because otherwise they would never know how to do it themselves yeah you know i've taken a few people on some hikes we do like a little hike and then we do a, a little nature meditation and um, people have really enjoyed that and that's been that's been beautiful for some people um yeah i mean coming back to nature is is a healing you know nature is healing in every single way and so um, I do take people out sometimes. Um, yeah. I have one more, one more voice to play for you, Marnie, and then we'll come back. I did not start singing with people as a spiritual practice, as a way to save myself until I was so close to, to dying of despair. Mahar, I, Maharaji sent me back from India. First, we sang to him in India. You know, he was sitting there, and we sang to him. He liked that, so we did it. It was never a self-referential spiritual practice, a self-conscious spiritual practice. It was just a joyful experience, singing to him. He'd sit there and smile and laugh and throw fruit at us, you know? So, then he well, sent just, me home Just to be America. clear, just to be clear, he was singing like, uh, you were singing like, like, like raga? Indian chant. Yeah, okay. yeah, great, great. Yeah. And then, so I started learning those chants in India, and I would sing the, a lot there because I liked it. Uh, then he sent me back to America after two and a half years. And then, uh, then he left the body, then he died before I could get back. And I was so crushed by that. I, I was so attached to him physically as being the only place, the only way I had ever been happy was when I was with him in a, cer in a certain kind of happiness that I thought it was over for me now, you know? And he's gone, and, and that's it. I'll never be happy again. So I started to live in a very... Uh, hopeless way and uh, a lot of things happened I got involved with heavy drugs again um, I was strung out on, on free days for about a year and a half two years at one point and I didn't start singing to him again until 1994 which is 21 years after he died my because God. I was standing in my room in New York and I was really in bad shape very unhappy tremendous despair and i walked into the living room and i was struck like a lightning bolt with the understanding that if i did not sing with people chant with people i would never clean out the dark corners of my own heart and of course i intuitively understood that that was my only problem that all my suffering was coming from this darkness and this, uh, these shadows in my own heart and that chanting was the only way that I had to do that it was just a flash and even then it took me a few months to figure out how to start doing that but that's why I sing I don't sing I don't sing to have bliss to have joy I sing to fucking live Marnie, I apologize about the language. Um, did you, 
Are you hip to Krishna Das? Yeah, I love him. So uh, he's a dear friend. I mean, we've done three interviews. That was my first one from February 2017. And it was, you know, on, on my journey, I've, as I pass these Rubicons, you get to certain people, um, and you talked about it before, you know, seemingly very people that sort of psych themselves out into thinking that things are so complex, but they're really not. And when I had did that first interview with him, that last thing he said, I used to think that for musicians or chanters, kirtan, whatever, that, you know, they, people were trying to reach a state of bliss and happiness and when he said that to me it just sent tremors up my spine he said i don't sing i don't chant for bliss i chant to effing live mm -hmm. and i hear in your voice marnie like i know we're very close in age i know we're very similar may similar constitutionally and so i really <sighs> Because I know you keep yourself in certain, I, you probably don't take psychotropic drugs, right? I mean, you, th that was probably, no. right? I mean, you, you, you want pure. Back in the day. Back in the day. I guess. No, I dig. I mean, I know you had to back in the day. And then like, yeah. and I can tell you, like, if I don't take, I'm not on a very large dose, but I'm not, I just need, that stuff's in my bloodstream. So I know why you don't want to take it. But I can also hear like this, it's seriously heavy to 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 deal with the 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 depression without any kind of medic you know in, in the, and you're doing it in the most purest way and I applaud it and I and I just to me I just to me it's like you, you would say that well there's two questions I mean you do yoga to 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 live is that is that right Oh my gosh, I do yoga to live. I, you know, I. I, I mean, it's not you're you're not reaching a state of bliss. You're doing it to effing live, right? Oh, you know what I'm doing it for is to fall in love with life. That's you know that's what I do. It's it's not it. You know, for a while I was seeking that bliss and enlightenment and all that stuff, and then I just, you know, realized like, really, what I want is to just fall in love with life, and that's all I need to do, and that's enough. Um, so it is, it's exactly what he said. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You, you, um, you see, I mean, with my girls, I sometimes see, um, the neurotic tendencies that I exhibited as a kid and a lot of parents, and it's not uncommon for them in any situation when they see things that they didn't like about themselves, <coughs> excuse me, in their kids, um, they often take it out on their kids. And for me, I see it as a duty as, as a father, um, especially if, you know, to, it's one of those things where I accept my shortcomings and I like to talk to them about it, especially my older daughter, if she's, it always helps her instead of pushing it away it's accepting that's just who that's just part of me and that, that's in her that's the genetic makeup and i i wonder if you're working on you know being seeing seeing some maybe it's not the same exact machinations but seeing things in your in your kids and and not resenting it but um embracing it Um, like, so what's, so embracing, meaning like, like, somehow. like, I mean, like, you know, like I was just a worrier, you know, I worried a lot when I was younger about things that anticipating things, anticipatory anxiety, stuff that never even really came true, but I was just a natural worrier. So my older daughter will come to me and she'll be all, and she's br way beyond me. I mean, she's brilliant and she's, uh, she's an incredible kid, but she's really wound up in her mind because she can't get a certain thought out of her mind or she is bummed out that she's letting she thinks she's letting people down because she's wasting all this time thinking about things that are not real and i and instead of saying you know some parents a lot of parents when they see these things in their kids the same kinds of things that they hated about themselves they push 
the kids away and they don't want to accept it. And I just wonder if you are tolerant and loving and embracing of the things that, you know, the neuroses that you see in your kids that are representative and remind you of you as a younger girl. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I think what we all do as parents is like, we don't want our kids to have the same sufferings that we did, you know. <laughs> I'm like, they'll suffer, but let it be something different than me at least. So, I mean, I'm really sensitive, um, you know, about like the, the body image stuff like I'm super careful around my kids that we don't talk about like dieting and we don't talk I never say anything bad about my body and um, I always just tell them how beautiful their bodies are and we don't talk about losing weight or gaining weight or any of that kind of stuff in my house and um, also I talk about emotions and we talk a lot about feelings because that was something in my house growing up that we didn't do a lot of talking about like it wasn't a very um we just didn't talk about how we felt about things. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So you're, um, you're, you're, you, you allow it to be more open with yeah. them, but I guess ultimately, I mean, you, if, if they come, if someone, if one of them comes to you at a certain point and starts to just because they're partly from you genetically and they're, they're fretting about the same things that you did, even though, they didn't have a mom like you did, would you be vulnerable enough to talk to them about your experiences? Sure. You know, I'll, I'll give them information that I feel like is age appropriate. Definitely. You know, like they don't know about my depression yet because I don't think that's, I don't think they're at a right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're too young. They, they wouldn't even understand. Yeah. 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 And so when it's, when it's the right time, I'll definitely share. I'm super open with my kids. Um, and I don't hide things from them. You know, I try, you know, I try to protect them definitely from things that are just not appropriate for them. They, things that they wouldn't understand yet. Sure. Um, but no, I'm going to be super open with them about, about my life and about who I am. You want to, before I let you go, um, like, um, uh, how happy are you? Like happy now, you know, there's, the idea of self-preservation um, and being at peace and, you know, you take care of your body, you take care of your mind, you take care of your soul, you do your yogic practices, but are you still, um, are you happy? You know, I feel like I love life. And every day I practice that hmm. and I don't think I'm happy. I'm not happy all the time. There are definitely things that I, I want, you know, I want, there are things that I want that I, I feel like I long for. Um, and I miss being around people and, you know, there are all kinds of things, but I feel very satisfied and I feel like things are in the right place. And um, I want what life wants. That's one of my practices is to want what life wants. And so I trust that we're in a time of transformation and things are being shifted and digesting and it's not comfortable. Um, but I do believe that this is part of a process and there's something bigger going on that's taking us to the next right place. So. I can hear, I, you know, I know that's, it's, I, I can, I can feel that what you're saying is true. And I, I like how authentic you are. I, so I went to Ward Melville High School, class of 96. Can you, what, what, what class were you? Um, I graduated high school in 92. Wow. You, so you, okay, my, my boys, I, they're not going to know you were a little bit ahead of them, but that, I mean, I, yeah. I am so honored and now I know even more why we were meant to connect because I've spent many a time going over the Ben Franklin Bridge into Philadelphia from Cherry Hill New Jersey and uh <laughs> me too <laughs> I know and I'll tell you I, I'm serious I, I mean I have blood brothers like I mean three or four that I'm just going through my head right now so I'm really it's so funny it is Marnie I, I I'd love to do part two with you down the road I I, I uh I, I think you're 
super grounded cat and I also know that you're humble enough to know that you know we're work we're in unprecedented times and and uh, anyway I just it's a small tribe and um, yeah. and I just want to I want you to be part of my tribe oh thanks Jake it was great talking to you and and it's such a great conversation well I'm glad that's all I care about is all you had a good time that's cool yeah, yeah, so thank you so much. All right, for bless you, me. friend. We'll talk soon. Okay, okay, yep. bye. Later. Cherry Hill Pride, that's it for the Jake Feinberg Show, and we will see you tomorrow.